<laughs> where, where did it all go wrong? <laughs> anyway, uh, my mum. Um, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, that's here for my mum. She lets me know I'm a partner, so I couldn't let her go. What's up? Please, no. Well, it's fun. Well, it's fun. Actually, um, back um, uh, yeah, back at that point about Anna being fearless, Anna being sort of zen-like and fearless, and I would give her a bit of advice, like, Anna, you've got to really, you know, you've got something here, and I think it's worth the world hearing. So these days, you know, c popular culture, it's owned by people who earn billions for, you know, uh, literally having no talent and having TV shows and selling perfumes and you know, secondary merchandise and so on. Literally billions, billions made by people with nothing to offer. And, you know, this this happens, I mean, this is a day at which a man called Richard Madeley has, uh, you know, disappeared from a, a show because he got ill because somebody poured rotten vegetables on him or something, and, and this is meant to be entertainment. Uh, what, what the hell? What's going on? So anyway, anybody who's got something to offer, I encourage that person, like Anna, if you feel you've got something to offer, make sure it goes out there. Make sure people can access it. Now, you don't have a budget to, you know, oblige them to access it or to put it in front of them necessarily, but if it's out there, if it exists like it does in Anna's case on a physical medium and digitally, if it exists, people can find it. And you don't know how people are going to be positively influenced by that. And um, one of the books I wrote uh, four, five, five or six years ago um, included a quotation from a book that I, I found literally um, as a piece of furniture. We, uh, my wife and I were at, uh, on a holiday in uh, Fermanagh, I think, at a hotel for a couple of days, and um, I was writing a book on John McLaughlin, the jazz guitar player, and uh, we were at a hotel, and it, the hotel had clearly bought a job lot of vintage books just to have as furniture, you know, to put up in a, a wooden uh, bookcase, and I was looking at these half interestedly and find one called Jazz in Britain from 1958 and uh, I liberated it. I freed that book. Heather uh, says stole. <laughs> <laughs> I freed that book from its imprisonment in oblivion. And I made sure to quote from that book in my book. So that book that book now lives again. That book now lives again. So if you make something physical, it it sticks around. It really does stick around. Um, and you never know who might hear it, who, you know, who, who might uh, benefit from that. Um, so anyway, I seem to have gone off the subject, or at least I would have done if I knew what it was. So I'm, I'm going to risk, I'm going to risk something now. I, I'm going to risk doing something now, um, which I wouldn't normally do because it's, it's quite demanding of an audience, and indeed of me, and I'm particularly worried because there's a man in here tonight called Cormac O'Gain. Cormac mastered Anna's album. Morris recorded it, Cormac mastered it, which is a kind of a black art that, if such a thing is possible, makes what Morris did even better. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh no, apparently it doesn't. <laughs> Morris is very generously and magnanimously he said Cormac fixed his mistakes. But I know there'll be a price to pay for that later on. But, Anyway, no, mastering is like polishing. It's like polishing a finely chiseled piece of furniture. And that's one of the things that Cormac does. And Cormac's, you know, a great friend to me. And and he did brilliantly by Anna as well. And, and you know, Cormac um, has always encouraged my artistry, such as it may be. And the world, the world has that to blame him for, I think. But, they, <laughs> but one of the things he once said to me, was, Colin, you've got all these miserable songs that people really want to hear, and yet you keep inflicting progressive rock instrumentals on them. They don't want to hear those. And this was actually something he said while smashing me against the wall of the studio. One day. It was about 10 years ago, and I've never let him forget that. And um, back, in, back in January this year, I had a, an idea. It was rattling around my head. And um, I had this vision of a battlefield in the dark ages of Eastern Europe, you know, mists and Carpathian mountains and 
hounds and horseback and you know forests and so on and I called it Romanian Battlefield and it, 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 it stuck around my head I couldn't get rid of it and next month I'm going into Cormac's studio to yeah, to do some tracks but I made sure that I recorded this track at a different studio because I know that Cormac doesn't like progressive rock instrumentals um, and I, I was frightened about what might happen to me um, but anyway, am I being fearless and putting on this evening? Uh, I thought I'd be fearless to play something that I wouldn't normally try and play in, in public for two reasons. One, because I'm not very good at it. And two, because it's got a dynamic range that's a little bit annoying. So if it's annoying, just think of it as a different texture and sound for the evening. And after which, Anna will appear and all will be mellow again. So. Romanian battlefield. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 